Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Setticase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This is a very special episode. I have with me Jess of the Shire. That is her YouTube name. I just know her as Jess. I actually don't know anything else about her name. But she's Jess of the Shire. She's got a really cool YouTube channel where she talks about Tolkien's Legendarium, Middle Earth, fantasy more generally, and also science fiction. She's awesome. So we talked all about sandworms versus dragons, talked about why I like villains, turned in a bit of a, a therapy session for me. She's really helpful, actually. She's really cool. So go check out her channel as well. I'm really excited for you guys to jump in on this episode. Before we do, I want to thank everyone who's making this podcast happen over on Patreon or on YouTube members. If you guys like this podcast, if it's one of your top five favorites, please consider becoming a Patreon patron or a YouTube member. There's different like perks you can have at different levels of support, but everything helps. I really appreciate it. And if you guys want to see me continue putting these episodes out, please consider supporting your boy. All right, that's probably enough commodification. Let's jump in with Jess of the Shire and talk all things Dune and Middle Earth. Okay, well, Jess, thanks so much for uh, taking some time here and coming on the podcast. Hi, it's great to be here. This is awesome. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, I have with me, I have Jess of the Shire. She's got an amazing YouTube channel. You probably should have heard that in the introduction. So no more introductions. <laughs> um, Jess, you're... How do you describe yourself when you when you tell people like what you do? Uh, well, I don't like to use the term YouTuber, um, which is something that. I should get over at some I point. Yeah. I I like to think of myself as a video essayist because um, mm -hmm. that is most of what I do. Most of what I do is is scripted and researched ahead of time and everything. Um, I like to think of myself as talking about storytelling, especially Tolkien um, and other kind of classic literature and fantasy literature. So. I, I don't know why I, I don't want to be called a YouTuber either. Um, <laughs> I'd always be like, no, I'm a podcaster, but now I have yeah. I mean, actual, I have like seven YouTube channels and the podcast is one of the least successful of them. So I don't know if that works. Yeah. Uh, like, do people ever call you an influencer? I literally, I was with, I was talking to some coworkers last night and someone referred to me as an influencer and I went, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I was like, no, please don't say that. Yeah, that's so good. <laughs> I, I get that too. And, and I study philosophy and theology and those sure. people are all old school. And so they're like, when they hear that term, like influencer, are you one of those? I'm like, dude, stop. I'm not, it's not really like that, man. If I'm trying to influence you in philosophy and theology, like I, it's good, the term good influencer is such a wide term, which is why I understand why they use it. Cause it is kind of like the most specific you can get about like people that create internet content and stuff but there's there's so much range contained in that because there's there's a big difference between like the stuff you make and the stuff mr beast makes versus what a family vlogger makes you know yeah it's a totally different and world. he makes a, a butt ton more money too so yeah I'm exactly <laughs> yeah, that's right. um well i actually wanted to ask you about video essays because a lot i don't know how many people will know about video essays but i'm into youtube so i watch a lot of it and a lot of this video essayists are like the faceless kind and they'll just mm -hmm. put pictures up over it. and you don't do that you have your face right there and i think you're you're good at um going to your script without making it like obvious you're not like reading like super obviously but what made you decide to like show your face and be a uh face uh essayist a face essayist i like that that's my new term instead of influencer <laughs> that's good. um so when i was starting to think about making content you know there's a lot of lord of the rings content online there are a lot of people who talk about lord of the rings and one of the things i noticed is is like you said that a lot of them were faceless and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that but i from my background i have a, a degree in theater so i'm used to doing things with my face and stuff and um so when it came to thinking about what I wanted to do in that space, I, I knew that that was something that could make me stand out and be a little bit different because there's an immediate personal connection that you get with somebody when you're seeing their face versus when you're just seeing pictures of art or clips of movies or something like that. And so for me, it was very important that I put myself as someone that you could connect to. So it feels less like a lecture and more like a discussion that you're having with a friend. Sure. Um, that's what, that's what I went for. And, um, I think it's worked out for the most part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You also do things that other essayists don't, which is like showing how to make lambis bread, which was awesome. I, I want to try that. So 
Like, it's a fun recipe. That was my first video too. Um, my original goal with the channel was to do a little bit more of like crafting, cooking, baking, those kinds of things. It hasn't really ended up being something I do often a lot of the times just because of time constraints and those videos cost more and they take more to make and stuff. Yeah. So I haven't done a lot of those. I hope to get into doing some more crafty things so that I can combine kind of costume making and historical co clothing and costuming with the video essay format Yeah, a bit. So it's... I. I like to think that it's it, my channel is not a lifestyle channel, but there are every once in a while elements of that creep in, and I just think it's fun, so I do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen that creep in, or I've seen that. It's hard when you get so niche where it's like, well, what else am I going to talk about? It's like, well, you can broaden these these things back out. It's like uh, you, you had one where it was, I live like a peasant. I baked medieval... like a medieval peasant for a month. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I like doing stuff like that. I just put out, uh, recently I put out one about plagues and storytelling uh, in plagues and that kind of tradition. And it's like, those videos are generally don't get, you know, the views and stuff, but they're also, they're topics that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I think, honestly, I think that putting my face and, and me as a personal brand into my channel has made people more accepting of stuff like that because it's like, this isn't just somebody who usually talks about Tolkien and suddenly this voice is talking about a totally different topic. It's like, that's Jess. And now she's talking about this thing because she wants to. Yeah. So yeah, I'm very, very glad to have that freedom. I'm very glad I have people that want to watch <laughs> the random totally. stuff I make. I love that. I, I keep anticipating all my questions, which is great. Um, I want to talk about cosplay really quick because I, I wanted to ask, like, do you consider yourself a cause player? Because that's a whole nother thing, too, where it's like people get really into it. But you do kind of dress up for some of your videos. Like the Dune one was like spot on. Like, wow, that's really good aesthetic here for this video. Yeah, I, I have I have had hobbies galore uh, throughout my life. I've had a lot of different hobbies. And when I was like 13, I got really into sewing and cosplay and stuff. Jeez. So that was like my whole thing for a year or two. And then doing theater, I continued with the costuming thing. And then currently my day job does involve a lot of sewing. So it's it's wow. things that I, I get to do <laughs> a lot of. Yeah. And so when I do get to bring the little, little costuming elements uh, into videos, it's a lot of fun for me because I know it's it's something interesting for the audience to look at. And frankly, when I'm editing my videos, it's something interesting for me to look at. Yeah. And I think there's such a connection between the um, the aesthetic of what you're watching. It's why the Lord of the Rings movies work so well is because built into the costuming into the sets um there's so much world building that you can put in just the visual messaging of what you're watching and so i really like to incorporate that wherever i can yeah i i want to do more of that myself and i i grew up wrestling so in the wrestling community uh man we tease each other a lot it's like right. you each other. and so i always have my friends in my head like if i wore this what are they gonna say and so i have to i'm slowly getting over it slowly yeah slowly. It's a slow process. It's like for all of the weird looks you get, though, you have to remember that there's somebody looking at you and going, I think you're the coolest person in the world. I was doing a I was doing a photo shoot a, a year or two ago where I was dressed as this like dark forest witch kind of character. And I was just out in a park with with my friend who's a photographer. And we were, you know, taking these pictures. I was shot with arrows. There was blood coming out of my mouth and stuff. And there was a family that walked by on the path. We had to get out of the way as this family walked by the path. And the parents were looking at me like, you know, like oh there's you know crazy lady out in the woods but their children were looking at me like this is something incredible that i'm uh, seeing in the forest and i can't explain it wow. so you always got to remember there's somebody who's going to be looking at you doing that weird thing and thinking you are the most magical thing that they've ever seen and that there's, helps me get through the weird looks that's so good that there's got to be a lesson in there about like losing your childhood whimsy at the parents and the kids oh that's, yeah that's so good yeah um there's a there's this aesthetic. You said it better than me. I always say aesthetic, but it's as I don't know how to say it. You say aesthetic. It I say aesthetic. All right, we'll go with that. Sounds. I get I get told that's the wrong way to pronounce it. Yeah, I know, but it's too hard to say. Um, there's this as, as there's a view on there's an aesthetic they called um solar punk. Have you heard of this before? Oh, I love solar punk. Yeah, and I just heard it's about neat. it because of YouTube. I learned so much stuff from the comment yeah. section, but I, I kept telling people I'm stuck between like Hobbiton and like blade runner and yeah like, man, I, I just love those two but they don't fit together you can't wear like leather black leather in the shire 
and people are like it's called solar punk dude it's been around for a while like check it out and i checked it i'm like that's pretty cool i think there's also i i with how many like aesthetics are out on the internet there's an aesthetic for everything but i think that also allows us a lot of freedom in the way we present ourselves these days because like the way i dress on my youtube channel is it fluctuates week to week sometimes i you know the the looks i do fluctuate very widely but also the way i look in my day-to-day -day life is very different from the way i look in my youtube videos but there is kind of a niche and people are willing to accept wider ranges of how people look and how people dress and i think that's I think that's a really neat thing about uh, the internet and what it's done. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right with that. Um, well, so your channel, it's not only Tolkien, but it is pretty Tolkien heavy, just of the Shire. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder, you don't feel free to get into as much detail as you want, but I wanted to just put it on record. Like, how'd you get into this? How, how did it become so a part of your life that this is like one of the main things you do? Well, I, the Lord of the Rings has been a part of my life. I talk about my dad a lot in the Dune video, and as much as he introduced me to Dune, he also introduced me to the Lord of the Rings. And I, I've always had a very fantasy-centric family. My mom read us Narnia when we were kids, and then um, I was very young when the movies were coming out and my dad showed them to me growing up you know, like covering my eyes at the scariest parts <laughs> and stuff. So that's always kind of been a place that I have escaped to. And then I noticed um, throughout my life growing up, one thing that kept coming back, because I have a lot of interests, but one interest that kept coming back was the Lord of the Rings. And mm. I kept, you know, I would get interested in something else, but always it would kind of be like, oh, I want to go back and learn more about the Lord of the Rings. I want to think about the Lord of the Rings. And uh, one day I was talking to my sister about some, I was ranting about something Tolkien related, Tolkien and industry and how people... Uh, misinterpret his opinions on industry a lot or something like that. She goes, you should start a YouTube channel. Mm. And I don't know if that was her trying to shut me up um, or <laughs> if it was a legitimate suggestion, but that stuck with me in a year or two later, you know, once I was out of college and stuff. Um, and I was thinking like, oh, I have this theater degree and I don't want to go act on stage in anything. Mm. Um, and I don't just want to work at a completely unrelated job for the rest of my life. What can I do with the way that I think about things and the way I learned how to think about things in college. And um, I thought about talking about the Lord of the Rings on YouTube and it just, it felt right. Cause it's, it's so interconnected into my other interests, into this larger concept of storytelling. Cause Tolkien was so in tune with that stuff um, that it, it feels like the perfect jumping off point to kind of open up this larger world of storytelling and get into talking about those things. Yeah. Well, it's, it's working out great. And it's been, uh, personally beneficial for me like I, I was telling you off air you recommended the spice months flow in your doing uh video and i read it and it was awesome uh and i got mad at some points but not mad at others and it was really really helpful um so i've just been like binging your videos because of this and i keep learning more and more stuff oh that's great and, yeah so I, I i love it i'm really grateful so for the listeners go check her stuff out right now it's jess of the shire um i'll put a link in the description so you guys can find it there as well um we got a little bit about like how you got started into Lord of the Rings. Uh, I want to just ask like the random questions. Like, do you have a favorite? Is it possible? Do you have a favorite character from? Oh, the, what a terrible, awful sorry. question I'm to so ask. Sorry. Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can have a favorite character because it kind of, for me, because I get so into topics when I'm, when I'm researching them, when I'm doing videos on them, it kind of just depends on like who I'm doing a video on at that point. Yeah. Uh, who I'm thinking about a lot because the thing about Tolkien is that everything he creates is so in-depth and these characters are so well built that pretty much any of the characters if you think about them long enough you can make an argument for them being the best characters you know yeah. um I've always as a kid I always loved Legolas because he was handsome and had the <laughs> long blonde hair and then I liked Aragorn when I got older because he's handsome and he had the long brown hair <laughs> um but like characters like Sam and especially Frodo, I think Frodo gets kind of pushed under the bus a lot of the times because he seems so weak. But when you look at it, he really is uh, such an important character and such a well-created character that, yeah, I'd say Sam or Frodo if we're not looking at the handsome long hair bias. <laughs> That's good. Your your video on, on Sam was was really great, too. I love oh, Thank you. Um, yeah, I. I just, I love Gandalf so much. He's so good. He just, yeah, he's so, so good. And I found 
people become super wise, like sages when they're writing about wise sages. And you're like, well, where did that come from? Like when you read mm-hmm. some of the proverbs or the aphorisms that go that uh, Gandalf sends, you're like, where where did you get this from? Like I don't understand how you're so wise. And it just, I, I guess they're thinking like, what would a, what would Gandalf say here? Oh, he'd say, you know, those he who breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. I'm like. That's changed my life, though. That's just a sentence, but you just changed my whole life with that one. Well, and I think what's so great about the way that Tolkien wrote Gandalf is that he has a very good reason for being that wise. It's not like he's just an old man, and so inherently he is wise. Tolkien literally made him an immortal being who is like all of this, who has been around since the beginning of time. So it's nothing that he does is incidental, and nothing is just done for the sake of like fulfilling a trope of like having the old wise mentor. Gandalf's character makes so so much much sense considering his role in the wider legendarium yeah i love it i love it well i want to put i wanted to put uh, middle earth in contact with arrakis once more um a trend that i've seen a lot in science fiction and i'm i'm seeing how people borrow from each other and whether or not so is totally like jazz <laughs> but it, growing up you know i i read all this stuff or i was all i was into all of it and i had this this theme kept emerging that technology bad nature good um and and star wars does a decent job of making the robots not evil right so you're like oh wow these are these are that's nice but everyone yeah. else is like no robots bad bro or or industrialization bad yeah um i wanted to talk about the feelings of the feelings on technology in arrakis and in in middle earth Tolkien to me seems like um i don't know he's got a pretty good like philosophy of technology that create stuff that is uh, in accordance with nature it goes along mm-hmm. the grain of reality and herbert seems like he's like hey man maybe it was just a rhetorical tool saying but larry and jihad to so no no ai and my stuff but he also seems like we need to live in accordance with our nature even as it changes throughout you know, human evolution or something so uh, yeah you get your thoughts on that yeah, that's interesting because uh, as I was saying when I was ranting to my sister a couple years ago about Tolkien and industry, it's a lot of people like to say like, oh, Tolkien is anti-industry. He is like anti-technological advancement. And that's, I really don't think that's the case um, because it's less so that he's anti-technology and more so that the technology cannot like supersede the importance of human beings mm. and like Sauron is using the technology, he's using gunpowder, he's using warfare for evil. He is using that against humanity. Whereas people like the hobbits, who are relatively technolo- technologically advanced um, in the grand scheme of Middle Earth, they have integrated their technology in a way that it allows them to be more hobbit-ish, you know? It it encourages their humanity rather than suppressing it in the way that Saruman's does. And I think Herbert picks up a very similar idea because it's not that technology is bad. You know, they still have spaceships. They've still gone through the stars and everything. But um, what Herbert shows is that no matter how much technology you have, humans are still humans. Um, and and these ideas, these grand ideas of, of religion, of ecology, these are always going to be the things that are important, not technology, as long as we don't do what was happening before the Butlerian Jihad and we don't let technology take over and become the new humanity, you know? Yeah, totally. Every day I get closer and closer to calling for a Butlerian Jihad. A little bit. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people who haven't read Dune and they're like, that doesn't sound like a terrible idea. (laughs) And I'm like, well. (laughs) I've been, I went, I took a deep dive in my philosophy masters into the philosophy of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I came out just being like, man, I don't like it at all. This is really tech. It's hard because it's one of those tools that can so easily be used in, in my opinion, the incorrect way. Because it's like, it's one thing if like, if there was AI that would load my dishwasher, that would load my dishwasher for me. Yeah, that's great. But I don't want AI to write my emails for me because like it's, it, it the it's creep is very, it's a very toxic creep because yeah. it's like, why there are so many mundane tasks that we could 
train this technology to perform. But that's never, that's not the stuff that's sparkly. That's not the stuff that seems cool. But a robot that can seemingly write an essay for you, that seems really cool, even though it's it's really bad, in my opinion. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. People tell me this all the time. And they're like, hey, you should try using ChatGBT to write a script Hi. for your stuff. And I'm like, what? Well, that's what I like. I like yeah, to be the one That's my job. Yeah. Like, I don't want to outmode my creativity. That's crazy. Even I thought about the um, bar house and there's so much yard work. There's like mm -hmm. an unbelievable amount of yard work. And people told me, but it's, it's cliche for a reason, which is also cliche for a reason. But I'm thinking like, yeah, if I had one of those electronic um, lawnmowers, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. I'm like, but I'm, I'd also be missing out on like getting in touch with earth. You yeah. know, as much as my yard is earth. But I do see, I see us on a baby turtle the other day. And there's sometimes there's snakes and I'm like, man, I don't know if the thing would just chop these up or yeah. what, but also like I get to see that and have that experience, which I wouldn't if I was just only writing scripts all day long because yeah. I have the AI doing other stuff for me. It's everything has to be in moderation. And I think that even like new technology like AI, you have to be really careful with it. But I think it can be used in moderation. You just have to not replace it's like it's like treadmills to me. Treadmills are really funny to me because it's like we took something that was just a pain in the butt that you had to walk from place to place in order to like get places before we had cars. And instead of continuing that practice, which we have done for hundreds of thousands of years of just walking to places mm -hmm. instead or running to places, instead we have treadmills, which we pay for to imitate the action of walking and running whilst getting ourselves nowhere. <laughs> but also, I don't think treadmills are evil. I think every once in a while it's too rainy or too cold or it's, you know, 5 a.m. and you don't want to go out in the dark for your walk. And so walking on a treadmill is OK. But also, if you only walked on a treadmill for the rest of your life, your brain would atrophy because that's not something that humans were were meant to do. Yeah. 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 I'm with you. I, I actually really like what you said about the hobbits using technology to bring out more of their hobbit to hobbitness or their hobbit essence, because they're they're kind of um, uh, the book view and like the movie view are probably going to change a little bit. But they're they're not super like gregarious. They they like enjoying life, right? They're yeah. like in, in life enjoyers. And so if they had to work in the field all day, they would have a bad time. But if they yeah. can. If they can use a, a plow, a wooden plow, to shorten that time, they can go fishing some more. And they can go smite. Exactly. They can enjoy. And, you know, you, you can still feel the, the earth beneath your hands. And you can still feel uh, what it is like to tend to the earth. But that doesn't mean that, you know, they're calling for you to plant your seeds individually and only right. use hand tools. Right. Um, they've just managed to maintain their technology in a place and time where um, it's not taking over over our human experiences yeah yeah it's, it's helping you be more human i think that's kind of like that solar punk aesthetic again yeah where it's like this would be what it would be like if industrialization had an eye towards conservation as well or something like that yeah and i think it's interesting when we consider like when the lord of the rings was written and and when tolkien was growing up and, and the experiences he was drawing from because he was really at a precipice um because he was you know Growing up in the early 1900s and into the 20s, going going to war uh, in, in 1915 or 16, and like that was kind of a technological renaissance because th that's really the beginning of the industrial age. And especially when you look at his childhood, when he had to move from this really idyllic countryside to Bir Birmingham, which was industrializing mm. more so, like incredibly quickly, he was seeing firsthand the way that he was seeing, oh, these are the things we should be holding on to. And these are the things that we need to let go because even if they do increase productivity, they are not increasing the human experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is so good. I really like your perspective. I think probably because you're like humanities heavy and that means you like the human stuff. And that's yeah. really good. Like I talked with a lot of philosophers and you kind of think, um, well, actually, Frank Herbert has summed up my experience in Dune Messiah. He mm -hmm. said, uh, in, in, in the mouth of Paul Atreides, Paul says, Paul's talking about his dream. He's got this dream of the moon falling. And he's talking to Hate, who's not stuck in Idaho yet. And he says, um, hey, I, I saw the moon fall. And Hate gives him like this mentat answer. And he goes, hey, I asked for the Zen Sunni, and I got the mentat. He asked for the, the wise sage, and he got the logic chopper. I'm like, man, that's so many people's uh, experience with philosophy where you go and you're like, philosophy, I'm going to be like 
later, I'm going to be a sage. And they're like, here is a formula and welcome to math class. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that so, uh, Herbert does such a good job of analyzing those philosophical ideas. I think in part, it really helps that he's writing sci-fi because it's such like a sci-fi thing to have like the Zen Sunni version of thought versus the Mentat and like having these separate terms and these separate almost programs that people use to analyze the world. But that really is a lot of the times how we how we have to look at the world around us. Um, and he, he does such a good job of transforming things that are so familiar into something that seems strange, but also makes way more sense yeah. <laughs> through sci-fi. I love that. And it, it kind of shakes up your... Um... It shakes up like your perspective where you're used to seeing something one way and you, he shakes it up and you're like, oh, wow, I thought about this because um, I want to be a Zen Sunni mentat. I want to be able to give you, <laughs> you know, I want to be able to give yeah. you a proverb like yeah. the way the way um, the way Tolkien does through the mouth mm -hmm. of his wizards. But I also want to be able to be like, well, here's why the argument's bad and, and be able to analyze. So because I have this sci fi concept in my head or, or SF, I should probably say, um, it's like it raises that childhood wonder in me, which is like. No, dude, I'm just going to be a Zen Sunni mentor instead of being like pretentious. It is making me a little pretentious, but at least I get to joke about it. <laughs> Herbert gave me the words for it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to talk. Okay. So I keep mentioning you, you put out two videos on Dune recently. And mm. both fantastic. the one on Tolkien, why Tolkien didn't like Dune, but maybe he should have. Maybe, you know, like analyzing it based on his, his own categories. I also... You you know more about this than me, but their politics seem relatively similar. Like Tolkien, I guess it, maybe it depends on um, what Tolkien really was. Or the, I, the, th the thing about Tolkien is like you have to remember that he was he was just a guy, and yeah. he was a really really stubborn guy, and he also wasn't. In the way that a lot of us tend to, like the way I am right now, I am speaking on this podcast in a way that is different from how I speak when I'm just talking to my friends. It, yeah. I'm thinking more about what I'm saying than if I'm just having a casual conversation because, be, because he wasn't expecting people to read his letters. He wasn't expecting people to pick <laughs> his stuff right. apart in the way that we do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Tolkien was not necessarily speaking for the audience that he has today. Um, and so a lot of his arguments, a lot of his opinions aren't super defensible. Like in a lot of ways, I do think he agrees with Herbert. I, I think that there were things he probably would have liked about Dune. However, he also just really liked stuff to be written the way that he wrote them. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's, it's always hard. Something I like to do what I'm having conversations about why Tolkien didn't like this thing or why Tolkien wouldn't have liked this thing is to remind people that like just because he didn't like them that doesn't mean that he had a great reason it doesn't mean that you need to dislike this thing yeah I I I like when um big figures big smart figures uh have beef with each other because it yeah. shows I, I just really like I like seeing why. why oh yeah why not like why didn't why wouldn't you like that and I think you did a great job of of explaining it and then analyzing it, analyzing Dune according to the, you know his fat his fairy uh, categories, Tolkien's fairy categories. I'm like, man, um, yeah, he was kind of crotchety. Yeah, I know that because I love C.S. Lewis. I have a whole bookshelf of everything C.S. Lewis, and I'm like, man, he he's always <laughs> like ragging on the boy. He's always going at him. And they were like good buddies, but um, I also heard that C.S. Lewis, when he got married, finally, Tolkien didn't really like her and. Someone had said, partially, the reason might be because she was a little bit grumpy and, and crotchety. And that was his role in Lewis's life. Yeah, I, Tolkien was, he was just, he was such a character and he was such a human being. It's like, I think a lot about how um, he was one of the reasons that C.S. Lewis converted to Christianity. He was one right. of the people that encouraged him to join Christianity. And then once C.S. Lewis became a Christian, Tolkien was really mad because C.S. Lewis didn't become the specific brand of Christianity yeah. that Tolkien, Tolkien was. Instead of a Roman Catholic. Yeah, so that good. and like C.S. Lewis started writing all these religious papers and religious works. And Tolkien was like, what do you mean? Yeah, You've you're been not at this for like a yeah. year. Right. Yeah. So it's like he was, um, he was an incredible mind. He really was. But he was also just like a little crotchety old british man <laughs> yeah it's so good well i don't know i do you know anything about his politics because i i know it's debated everyone's always arguing over the bones of of lewis and tolkien and all these people but 
from what I've heard, he was like, hey, look, I don't really trust power that much. And I'm more, I don't know if anarcho-capitalist or anything like that is like a good word. Probably not. But at least he had some distrust of like centralized power, maybe. I don't know. What do, what do you I, I think you can definitely get that from his writings. Okay. Um, I, I think he was also just hyper aware of what power could do to somebody um, and, and what what power what ultimate power does because kind of idea that absolute power corrupts absolutely yeah. he was but it's also you have to remember the very the context that he was also a christian and if he had it his way there would be a monarch ruling who was you know the pope would be in charge right. like totally. it's he, he as long as you had god and you had god in the specific version of god that he saw um that kind of absolute power was that kind of power was all right with him because that was the correct kind of power. So it's I I think it there's a lot of nuance to it and um mm. it, it, you can definitely get it from his works and you see in his works how he had a very good understanding of what happens when you put somebody in charge and leave them completely unchecked. Mm. And he knew that even if there was going to be a king, like Aragorn, because the series ends with another king being put in power, but Aragorn was a good king. And so he's okay with rulers as long as they are Aragorn-type rulers, where they are the pinnacle of humanity and will only do good. And you can have conversations about how possible that is, like whether or not any human can actually stand up to that, you know, that parameter, but I think that's how he looked at the world without doing a lot of research on the subject. I think that's great. That sounds, that sounds right. That's really, that's really great. I, and I want to put that back in touch with like Frank Herbert, who would mm -hmm. probably say, no, I don't care how good Aragorn is. Like uh, he's got this one quote, Herbert has this one quote about, she's like, I don't think absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I think um, those who rise to power already kind of have that in them. And that's why they rise to power in the first place. And it's like debated whether, Hey, is it power? Is it the power structure? Is it the uh, the surrounding? Is it is it? That? I I almost think for Herbert that it's just humanity, <laughs> and and he has uh, his whole essay where he's uh, I can't remember the title of it, but uh, his essay where he talks he's basically just explaining what Dune is about. It's like two pages long, and he has a section in it about how um, humanity creates these systems, and as soon as we have somebody who is in power, we create systems around them that allow them to abuse us. Mm -hmm. And I think he just saw humanity as, whether it is the leader's fault, whether it is um, the people's fault, or whether it is this ecological, this wide-spanning ecological relationship between theology and society and, and all these interconnecting things, when we have somebody who has a lot of power, they nine times out of ten will become abusive because that is just how humanity and the ecological system of humanity functions yeah i love that um you also did a great job of mentioning his ecological approach uh and that how it's not just ecology in our modern sense but it's about there's an ecology of mind an ecology of yeah. society and it's this living kind of organism thing um i wonder do you think that tolkien or do you think that Herbert was successful in making Paul Atreides? Uh, I don't know how much he intended him to be a warning or what, but people always online are nuts, but they're always like, you missed this. You missed, if you like Paul, then you missed it. You missed the threat. And it's like, well, maybe Herbert did a bad job of making him hateable. Cause I, yeah. I don't think you should hate Paul. And I don't, I, I, I personally don't. And I think that if you do hate him, there's nothing wrong with that because he did horrific, awful things. Mm -hmm. But you also, once if you've read Dune and you haven't just read Messiah, you cannot deny that he is like, he is a human being. He is a person who is trying to do his best. And I am a fairly empathetic person. And so I can't help but put myself in right. his place. And would I do the same things as him? No, I would not do the same things as him. I I, I can't have that on my conscience. Yeah. Um, but also... It's like he was doing the best he could with the information he had. And I, as much as Paul Atreides is the villain and does become the villain, he's also, more importantly, a person. And Herbert does a really good job of not letting go of the fact that he is a human being. Um, at least Paul is, you know, that's this says nothing about his son, who is a whole other <laughs> bag yeah. of worms. But Yeah, literally, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's good. It's really good. For those who don't know, he becomes a giant sandworm. It's um, really freaky. Very yeah. bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jess, I wonder, for someone like you who's who studied a lot of 
of Tolkien and been kind of in his mind a little bit. I wonder how much this is speculation. I know. I'm sorry. but It's still fun, though. I yeah, speculate all the yeah, time. Yeah, that's good. Okay, good. So he, um, C.S. Lewis was like, hey, I'm going to teach Christianity. I'm going to mm-hmm. uh, through the back door. I'm going to take an indirect approach. I'm going to give you really good stories. And look, if you don't get it, you don't get it. But if you do get it, cool. Then I'll inculcate virtue and all sorts of stuff in you. And Tolkien's like, I don't know, like, I'm not going to be as direct as you in my stuff. And maybe I won't put Santa Claus in uh, Middle Earth. But I wonder, just imagining Tolkien reading Dune, do you think that he was more like, he he said he profoundly disliked it, or I forgot the exact words. You remember? Uh, He didn't like it. It was fun for him, um, who was like his English gentleman trying to like keep in his distaste for it. Um, Crotchety though he was. I wonder, do you think he, he was more upset by like, the storyline and hey look there are certain parameters that uh, a story ought to go a certain way it ought to be you have this topic so that it has a good ending or do you think he was more like the underlying philosophy of taking in like this union collective unconscious where people can like wake up to their ancestors stuff do you think he was more like this, that's a wrong philosophy or more like the story isn't going where stories ought to go i think for tolkien Tolkien could not have written a story that did not preach his personal philosophy. Okay. Everything that he wrote was so deeply infused. At least, you know, this is my read on it. But everything that that he wrote was so deeply infused with his philosophy and his beliefs. He, he even started a piece that he called The New Shadow, which was going to be like a sequel to The Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. um, and I, I did a video on it, but it, it goes down a really dark path of like after everything has ended... Uh, after Aragorn has won, Aragorn dies and evil starts coming back. Mm. And he started that story and basically gave it up like 10 pages in um, because it was too dark and he recognized that it was just going to be a thriller without any, that that's the specific word that he used. He never said exactly why he didn't finish it. I hypothesize on it in the video, but I think it's just that it was going down too much of a dark, too much of a nihilistic, isn't quite the right word, but too much of a, a nihilistic path. Um, and so he just did not write things that he did not personally philosophically agree with. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not sure if there can be a dividing line with, with Tolkien reading Dune and saying, like, I disagree with the way this story was written and that it's not going towards a happy ending. Oh, yeah. I think he saw that as reflective of the wider philosophy of Dune and of Herbert. And he could not separate the art from the artist in, in the way that a, a lot of people can. I, I just don't think that's something he was willing to do. Yeah. That's a really good point. I, I, yeah, that's fascinating. I need to chew on that some more. Um, that's good. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Tolkien wanted, Tolkien said it was one book. It's not three books. It's the Lord of the Rings, yeah. right? It's one book. Do you think it would have been as popular if it was just one book? I know there's like printing problems. No. Oh, no. I, I think it would have been a mess if he had printed it as one book. I think you're right. Yeah, that would be gigantic and only hardcover if he had his way, right? <laughs> Exactly. And I, I, in a video that I'm just about to put out, I, I talk about his languages and how if he had had it his way, he would have just written a fictional dictionary. Um, <laughs> but he, he did understand to a certain degree that, you know, he would have made up so many more languages and so much more of it would have been in Elvish and it wouldn't have sold and it wouldn't be what it is today mm. because he, despite how, you know, strong he was with his opinions, I think he did understand that there is a certain palatability um, that you have to have. And especially in the era that he was writing, if he put it out today, if Tolkien was alive today and the fantasy scene was what it was today, and he put out The Lord of the Rings as one solid volume, I think it would have done fine. Mm. But especially at that time, I don't think that people were ready to see that much super dense epic fantasy. Yeah. Um, in one place. I, I I just don't think it would have sold. Well, especially as sidetrack kind of, but um, because it gained so much popularity because it got printed as a paperback yeah. and it became the cult classic. Part of the reason that it became the cult classic is because it was in paperback and because it, that felt more, uh, you know, non-establishment uh, mm. to be reading a paperback book. And that's something you can hand off to a friend and say, oh, do you want to read the next one? Um, and that's why it got so popular on college campuses. So you kind of, I, I don't think it would have done as well. No, if it was one big break. I So I got this mostly from you, I think, uh, because I, I've been just diving in the story and the philosophy and the theology of it. But then 
I was thinking about how do, how do books come to be, you know, cult classics and stuff. And I, I was watching one of your videos and you talked about how uh, Ace put out that bootleg version. So I found those on eBay, actually. Oh, really? Super cool. Ah, that's so yeah. exciting. And I kind of feel bad about having them because I'm like. Yeah. Talking's like, dead. You won't yeah, complain. Yeah, he's gone. Yeah. So these are like, <laughs> I actually like these more than the official ones he put out. I have they're ones. they're colorful. They catch the eye. Yeah, these ones are like, yeah, Tolkien's probably like this. This is what I want, and the rest of us are like, mm, it's cool. It's really cool still now because it's become like a thing, an art style. But um, look at this. I don't know. You can't see it that well, but yeah, um, I, they're gorgeous copies. So good. Like this Gandalf one is is uh, makes me want to be like a Gandalf. I want to be him. <laughs> um, but so it's just funny that that was being passed around by like their hippies and stuff and the were enjoying the uh, British invasion. And meanwhile, Hawking's, you know, in Oxford in a wool coat, you know, just like smoking a pipe being like, super, not establishment because he didn't really like establishment, but just old crotchety. He like, was, I mean, he so was, good. he was an Oxford Don. Like yeah. he was, you know, he, he was an old, professor who wore tweed and he his day de- his idea of a, an exciting outfit was when he got a new color of waistcoat like <laughs> it's but at the same time i it really goes to show just how diverse the lord of the rings is mm. because it works for people who want that really intellectual deep dive who who want to you know his his co-workers basically other scholars who want to treat this as a scholarly work of art and it also works for the 19 year old hippie who's who thinks that it's really trippy and really cool and mm. and connects to the journey of frodo and it's such an innately human story i think and that's why it was able to connect to so so many people yeah yeah that's mm, that's so good so as someone who really likes Tolkien and do you call it the legendarium or, or how do you speak about his you know, ah, the legendarium is kind of the wide scope of like Silmarillion unfinished tales everything so middle earth maybe I'll, sure someone who likes the Tolkien works um why why do you like doing how come you didn't follow uh Tolkien and be like no I'm not I'm not with it it helps that I'm not Tolkien um, in so many ways, I'm not talking. I think about this a lot because so much of what I've made my career at this point is talking about like, you know, old male writers. And like, I think about Tolkien and I'm like, Tolkien wouldn't like me. He yeah, wouldn't ask you that like too. me. Yeah. And so I, I think it's important to separate the art from the artist a little bit in these conversations because it's like, yeah, Tolkien didn't like Dune because he was very picky about the way he re- liked books being written because he was, you know, he liked a really happy ending. However, my my own personal beliefs don't perfectly align with Tolkien's. Uh, you know, my my philosophy does not totally align with Tolkien's. So while I can value his stories for how beautiful they are, I also luckily have the flexibility to enjoy things like Dune that have such a different such a different outlook on the world. Um that's great. That's that's cool. I I align with with talking a lot. So he's Roman Catholic and mm. I'm uh, Protestant. So there's mm. like also some stuff in there where we're like, no, I think I would disagree with having yeah. both be in the. Um, but I so am about his like you catastrophe, and I'm always mm. surprised when I like stuff that's not like that. Like No Country for Old Men. Yeah, it's like horrible. And my my dad gets like he's like very offended by that ending and like, have you ever seen that movie or familiar with uh no i'm not just the bad guy wins uh, yeah sorry spoilers but no, no that's like... not supposed to happen you know you're not and i'm like man i love that i don't know what my problem is but oh. i love bad guy like i like the balrog my favorite part. oh yeah it's my favorite part of lord of the rings is the yeah Bal- there's something i think wrong with i me. love I a villain no i don't think there's anything wrong with you i think that it's um so Tolkien really liked something. He liked the catastrophe because he thought saw it as symbolic to this this larger ending of the world that everything yeah. is going to be right in the end because God is going to make it right. Um, but also, I think it is okay to have stories that show something that is not that because it gives you something to hope for even more. Because mm-hmm. you look at Dune and you say, um, "This is a horrifying state for humanity to be in. If this is how we are, how the cycles of humanity are always cursed to go." that sucks and so there is almost a hope that comes from that of like this is giving me the encouragement i need to try and be better in my own life and to try and improve the things around me because it is just a story it's not reality um so even stories that do end in darkness that do end in with the bad guys winning um it's important because that's that's not real life you know yeah 
I think that's good. I, I'm I'm been chewing on this a while. I have one of my uh, one of my other YouTube channels is about like notebooks and journaling. Mm. One of my one of my journals that I work through. Like, why do I like this or that? And it's often like, dude, I know I'm not supposed to like Gaston. Why do I like Gaston? I I know I'm not supposed to like him. Like, he's also he's fighting a monster from his perspective. This monster kidnapped a woman. He's a jerk. I understand. Yeah. You know, so I'm just like I wrestle through this stuff and I think about you know Balrogs and like. I think probably part of it is we're, we're we may be better at describing bad things than we are at describing good things. Um, or maybe part of like a narrative is making, I've heard people say making the main character like a little bit more bland. So, you, so the reader can insert themselves in that position. Right. Have you heard this before? Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. So maybe that's, maybe that's part of it too, but like that Balrog giving a counter curse or whatever, was like the most epic thing ever. It's even better oh. than the movie. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, the thing's crazy. So then when, when he is vanquished, it's even, it's a bigger deal. It's not like this was, yeah. easy, oh, this guy was a demon. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, humans have always loved stories about monsters. Um, mm. I, I did a big video on Frankenstein. And so I thought about Frankenstein a lot for a while there. And like the characters in Frankenstein are bad. They are monstrous. There's there's multiple, you know, villain characters, but there, there are monstrous characters in that book. And yet I think a lot of us can see parts of ourselves in these characters. Mm. And, and um, I, I think that there is, especially in the realm of fiction, where it is a little bit more safe to explore these ideas, I think it is important to explore these ideas and to see like, okay, if I keep following this, this if I keep following this part of what I want in the way that I am, this is where it could take me. Maybe I want to redirect my life and stuff. And so it's it's not and it's not necessarily just for moralizing there's also just the fact that it's fun it's really fun to look at these characters and kind of look at the darker side of this thing but um stories are such a safe place to explore these ideas and i think it's important that we don't judge ourselves too harshly for what we like in stories because sometimes that's just how your brain copes <laughs> This is this is turning into a therapy session for me. It's actually really helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you for indulging me. Um, I wanted to. Speaking of monsters, I love where your where your head's at. We keep going down the perfect the uh, golden path here. Four. Yeah. Uh, dragons versus childhood sandworms. Uh, oh. What do What do you think is more like compelling? What do you think? It depends on the dragon. So the thing about the thing about childhood, the thing about the sandworms is that. Um, as opposed to like a dragon like Smaug or like a Chrysophylax, who's another dragon from Tolkien's lore, or Glaurung, um, all of those dragons talk. And that's kind of where their compelling monstrousness comes from, is from like their personalities that they have, which are these really cool personalities and wicked personalities. We get to hear them talk. We get to see their evil deeds and stuff. Or not, if not evil, then, you know, mischievous deeds. Um, but Shailud is interesting because it doesn't talk i mean until we get uh you know man worm in later books <laughs> um but shy hulud is such a clear expression of nature and that's kind of where the more literal definition of of herbert's ecology comes in mm -hmm. because um he had this belief that there are some things like shy hulud that are both good and bad in the way that we perceive them because they're just nature, because they don't think. They don't have that kind of human-like intelligence that Tolkien gives to dragons, that a lot of mythology gives to dragons. They really are just a pure part of nature. And a lot of how they interact with human beings is dependent on how human beings treat them. They're not inherently evil. They're also not inherently good. They're just animal. Yeah, yeah that's really good. Yeah, I, I like that. They're I like to, I, I really like categorizing things and it's hard to categorize sandworms. And I'm like, well, they're like the dragon version. And it's like, not really, because they don't have personality, but they are like this monster. Yeah, but Herbert's more more focused on ecology. So it's part of the grandeur story of the planet and stuff. Um, I do have, I have this picture of um, conversation with Smaug right hey. here. And uh, he's like huddled around his goal. And I'm in my office surrounded by my books. And for me, it's a reminder, don't be like Smaug. Like these are my treasures and stuff, but people are important too. So don't be so obsessed with your stuff. Like there could be a fire in here and it could all go. Don't be like him. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Do you take, there's something about having like a hoard of gold that draws the mm -hmm. dragon in. What do you, what do you think Tolkien's getting at? 
So Tolkien's dragons are, they're like the epitome of the dragon, aren't they? Because it's he's drawing from so many of these older mythological traditions uh, to to get the dragon that he has uh, that he has in his stories. So they really are like kind of um, the platonic ideal of <laughs> dragon, uh, the the ultimate dragon, and um, they are a manifestation of the worst parts of human beings. And I think there's something interesting to be said for the fact that these are like some of the most villainous characters that we see in, in Middle Earth, at least in Tolkien's world. And um, Tolkien doesn't let those villains be human. Uh, he allows the truly monstrous to be truly monstrous. And he has human-ish villains. He has villains like Saruman, like Wormtongue and stuff, who are, you know, relatively human characters that are choosing to do evil things. But this pure manifestation of evil, he leaves that to the monstrous, which I think is a an apt reflection of his his Catholic and Christian beliefs, because I, I don't think he would have made a character like that who is purely human, but was also the full manifestation of pure evil. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, if it's going to be anthropomorphic, it needs to be redeemable in principle. Maybe. Yeah. Even, even if they don't get redeemed. And at least understandable, the, the evil of dragons is so self-centered and so not super accessible like you know we all like have are a little greedy sometimes but that doesn't mean we are burning villages to the ground because we don't care about the human lives that are there i mean hopefully not i don't know what yeah. you guys get up to um but, but yeah um there's a i don't know so i'm big into the lord of the rings every time i try to pick up the cinema really and i don't and i i don't like that because i'm like i i'm a nerd i need to nerd out on that and i was too <laughs> I pick it up and I go, well, let me just start with, uh, let me just go back to, you know, this restart one. fellowship, you yeah. know, <laughs> and restart it again. So I don't know a ton about the dragons, but you, you've had some good videos on it and I've, I've binged a bunch of other people's uh, essays. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it. Is it, you said it earlier, Glau, which, what, what's Glau the one with Glau Glaurun? Glaurun. Okay. And yeah. is that the one who tricks the dude into like marrying his sister? Yes. Yep. 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 He's the, he's the one involved in that story. Uh, and what? So I should know all these names, and I don't. Sorry. Right. What, what what's the guy's name? That's like uh, Lord, Hurin. Lord. It's the oh, Children Hurin. of Hurin is the story. So that's Turin Tudumbar. Okay. And you like, it's kind of like a retelling or a different take on like an Oedipus. Like it has know, elements of know? that. Um, one thing that I really enjoy about the Silmarillion, and the only reason I'm kind of like it would be interesting to get adaptations of these stories, is because he plays with style so much in the Silmarillion. Because mm. we have stuff like the the Tale of Baron and Luthien, which is a poetic drama, a poetic romantic drama that I think would do beautifully as like a stage show or an opera. And I think there have been some operatic adaptations of that. Mm. And then you have stories like the tale of Turin Turumbar, which is this incredibly dark, like almost Greek epic inspired story where it is the, it is the pinnacle of a tragedy, like a true epic tragedy where we see someone going from Oedipus like. So it's like, yes, it's Oedipus in terms of like there's incest in it, yeah. but I think it, it reflects the tragedy of a story like Oedipus where you have someone who's on top of the world doing as well as they can. And then through the story, we see them fall, fall all the way down the ladder to the deaths of, of human despair and it was like all a big plot by the dragon yeah i mean he's in on all of it he's kind of pulling the pulling the strings and stuff because there was this long-term curse on his family it's very, oh yeah was very it very that Malcor, like, I, it's the family or uh, i'm gonna get roasted if i get this wrong but i'm pretty <laughs> sure i'm pretty sure it was his fault overall yeah. most things are in middle earth well that's and that is so different Right, that's it. It's so different than like the sandworm stuff because you're like, no, this mm -hmm. dragon has agency. He wants to do things, and he wants yeah. to do like wicked things. He's like about it. Well, and it's like so. Herbert created his sandworms. He had to know that they would be compared to dragons. Mm -hmm. But in that way, I think his sandworms subvert the dragon narrative. Yeah, because it's him taking this thing that is like, oh, usually this thing is evil, and it is an acting evil force. And especially the way he transforms them, uh, just from like the beginning of Dune to the end of it, where you start Dune going, ooh, evil, scary sandworms. They're so villainous. Mm -hmm. But then by the time we're seeing the Fremen point of view, it's this thing is not evil. This thing is a part of the ecosystem. This thing is something that can help us if we help it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's 
a lot of what he does, what Herbert is doing is subverting these traditional fantasy narratives to kind of give us a refreshed view of how we can look at these, um, yeah, just traditional fantasy tropes. Yeah, that's so good. It's going back to that theme of, you know, living in accordance with nature. Yeah. So you made this point and then I read it in the Spice Must Flow that Herbert kind of took on the persona of being like an ecologist. He'd start speaking at like Earth Day and stuff like that. And maybe he wasn't like that before. And probably wasn't. And I, I wonder about that theme as well, because so many people grab so many ecologist type folks. I don't know if they still do, because now everything's about subverting everything. So subvert, your, you know, your teacher's subversion of him. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know if it's as straightforward. I want, I want to get your take on this. Like they are riding the sandworms. The sandworms don't naturally they're not naturally ridden and then they're exhausted and then like they have to you know go back down in the sand is that man like exerting himself over nature or is he actually living in accordance with it like what i don't know if it's straightforward but maybe maybe you think it, it is it isn't as straightforward as always um frank herbert refuses to let anything be simple mm. because it is as much as like the fremen are like oh they're living in harmony with nature and stuff again like you said they're riding the sandworms to the point of exhaustion there that i think there are certain things about human nature that herbert sees as fully unavoidable mm. um that, that we will use these things but at the same time when you look at the larger narrative around the sandworms they're not native to arrakis um they were brought there and they kind of took over the planet and turned it into desert mm. so it's oh, yeah, like right. Right. It's are humans being uh, exploitative of the worms or is it just this recurring cycle that the worms exploited the planet and turned it into something for themselves? And then the Fremen exploited the worms and then the Harkonnens exploited the Fremen. Mm -hmm. Herbert does a really good job of showing us these cycles uh, of how these things just tend to be perpetuated. And I think it's this part of this overarching message that looking at the world in good versus bad is incorrect instead it should be looked at as ecological as everything is having an impact on another thing yeah that's a good point he he in the later books he's jumping thousands of years yeah he, now there's all this water but then that's killing the sandworms and exactly and forth. um okay this might also get you rusted but um herbert has this idea i wish i knew the quote because it's really good um that when you like when you're shaping politics or shaping government, you're shaping like human history. If you let go, it snaps back. It's like plastic. It snaps back into the same pattern. Yeah. 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 Um, it's a little trade quote, I think. Yeah. So there's like that. Hey, look, if you let go at all, it snapped back. There's a familiar pattern that always emerges or always is there. It's, it's plastic. Um, it's not as plastic. It's, it's more rigid. And then there's like Tolkien's you catastrophe of like, Hey, everything bad will come undone uh, or untrue. Right. So it's going to be a good ending, even though you can't see it in the darkest, you know, she loves coming for you, but there's a plan maybe between those two with, without getting like your personal beliefs or anything. Yeah. Which, which one of those is more compelling of a story for you? I don't know if I could say which one is, is more compelling because it's in a way it's talking about the same thing in a different language, right? Like it, it is, um, so Herbert thought that everything would snap back into its familiar form, that it, that it, it's, you know, it's like plastic. You, you misshape it, but when you heat it up, it goes back to its usual form. Um, and Tolkien thought that, you know, no matter what we did, we would be saved by this, by this force at the end of, at the end of time, we, we would be saved by righteousness. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if I have one of those that I find specifically more compelling i'm i'm really bad at critique that's why i don't crit i barely critique anything on my channel because i think that analyzing what that says you know what what people write and what that says about them is far more entertaining than than trying to say which is better because it's almost like these two differing views of the the plastic snapping back versus the eucatastrophe it is almost like looking at um, an atheist or ag an agnostic's view of the world versus a Christian's. Mm. And yet, despite how different they are in form, you can kind of see that it is a very similar idea that the two are that the two are zeroing in on. Mm. Um, and I don't have a larger point there, but I just think that's neat. <laughs> that is neat. No, I, I really like that. There's um, in philosophy of religion circle. There's uh, a new debate. There's always debates, right? But they found a new way to debate. 
And it's not just does God exist, it's should we want God to exist. And so it's, it's yeah. pro pro and anti that. So there's some people who are atheists who are like, man, I'm a I'm a pro theist in that I wish God does exist. I just yeah. don't think he does. I think it'd be better if it did, but he did. and other people, other atheists were like, no, we shouldn't want him to because we wouldn't have freedom and agency and yeah. And and all of the if you're a theist, you're probably not an anti-theist when it comes to all that. You yeah. know, I think he exists, but I wish he didn't. You know, <laughs> maybe you are, but that's that's tough on both. I, I kind of I I like conveying that kind of stuff through analyzing stories because mm. that's stuff that we all think about. And it, oh and yeah, it's like exactly what you said. I was trying not to like try not to pin you down on that, but yeah, your your taste in stories may reflect what you believe. Uh, it may not though, right? You may be exactly. like, hey, look, I'm not I'm not this, but I I'm always tend towards these kind of stories, and maybe mm -hmm. I do wish this or that, but maybe I just like maybe that's just my taste, and I'm not sure why that's my taste. There's also, there's so much that can be learned from going into stories, any story, whether or not you think you're going to agree with it, with an open mind. Yeah. Um, and, and being willing to read things and experience stories that aren't, that you, you're no, you know you're not necessarily going to agree with, right. because that flexibility of thought, you may get more out of it that affirms your personal beliefs, even if the story doesn't necessarily affirm your personal beliefs. Um, allowing yourself to explore that is, it's hardly ever going to be a bad thing, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and if you, if you end up like changing your mind on something because of a story, well, that's cool. Then that's yeah, good. you got exposed to a new worldview through a story. That's kind of sweet. I like that. And at the very least, it gives you a wider understanding of what other people around the world think. You know, what, how other people might be thinking about these things. Yeah. So I'm I'm a huge uh, Philip K. Dick fan, and mm. I can't like escape it. And I don't agree with him <laughs> on so much, but I'm like, I just am so compelled to read his stuff, and it's the always the exact opposite. Of you catastrophe it's just catastrophe yeah. and it doesn't even tie up all of his loose ends he'll like send you one way and you're like okay i'm waiting for you to you know cash in on that he never does and you're like did he just forget or is he trolling me i don't <laughs> understand but i like it on to the next book um i wonder do you i know that you've, you've done videos on like on frankenstein and, and other science fiction stuff um as well as well as fantasy are you are you reading other stuff too like are you a fantasy fan are you in the, i am in the a fantasy stuff? fan um i my relationship with reading has always been a bit back and forth because like I read really voraciously as a child, but then when I got into high school, I had problems focusing and I was too busy. And so I got less good at reading and I'm kind of getting yeah. back into it now. Um, I try to read as wide of a range as I can. It ends up mostly being fantasy or sci-fi just because that's where my personal taste lies. But there's stuff like um, a lot of the grimdark that I've read where it's like Joe Abercrombie's um, The First Law and uh, The Age of Madness after that uh, is like incredibly dark. And it's some mm. of the most dark, depressing, awful things that I've ever read. It all just goes terribly. And when I finished um, the the last book in the second trilogy, it was such a dark ending. It was such a downer that I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach. Like I felt like physically sick after reading the end of that book. And I was like, that was not an experience that like I enjoyed, but I thought it was great. Like I learned so much from from reading a book like that. Uh, so I, I try to read stuff that challenges me, even if it does end up usually coming back to... Um, to the stuff that I love, but yeah. yeah. Well, I'm with you on that too. And, and, uh, the science fiction fantasy stuff, like I, I have to read a lot of philosophy stuff because that's like what I do, but then I'm like, man, if I can find this in a novel instead, let's maybe, you know, we don't always have to be messing with, with logical. It's operating. fun to do both too. Yeah. You know, it's fun to, yeah. to, to read both nonfiction and fiction about the same things and see how they approach the topics differently. Yeah. Um, there's a newer series called sun eater. I don't know. Have you heard of that at all? I don't. I feel like I've heard of it. I have not read it. It's one of those things that I'm, I bet a lot of your audience is like, hey, read Sun Eater, because they did that to me for like six months. And they were just like, read it, read it, read it, read it on multiple channels. And so I read it and I had the uh, the author, the author Christopher Rocchio on. Oh, and neat. He he would like go to bed uh, every night listening to the Lord of the Rings when he was full. <laughs> and then, uh, then he was a big Star Wars guy and a big Dune guy. So it's like Dune, Star Wars, and Lord of the Rings. It's the big, more than the big that. three. <laughs> yeah, but it but it's got the it's got the goods there. So I would I would recommend that one. Yeah, but I'll he, check it out. He categorizes it as science fantasy. Um, yeah. And I wanted to hear. I'm going to get your take on that. Like, what do you, what do you think? Um, 
Dune is like the prototypical sci-fi or sci- SF science fiction and Tolkien's, you know, Lord of the Rings is like the, the prototypical fantasy, but they're, are they broader than that? Does that rightly categorize Yeah, them? I mean, genres are fake. Genres were made up by marketing companies to sell us books. I, I, I think when I look at fantasy versus sci-fi, my rule for differentiating the two is that sci-fi uh, looks forward. Uh, sci-fi looks forward and, and to a possible future and mm. tends to uh, tends to tackle how will human beings respond to change very head on? Isaac Asimov has a specific definition that I've used in many videos that I don't remember. Um, so there's something about how, how human beings respond to change. Whereas fantasy is much more escapist in nature. It's less looking at how human beings are, uh, how human beings are responding to change and more so looking at how human beings are currently and using an alternate reality or an unreality to explore things that we are currently feeling or that we have felt in the past. Um, That being said, those are really loose definitions and there's a ton of crossover. Like I would say that Star Wars is probably somewhere in that happy medium between science fiction and fantasy because how much does does Star Wars truly challenge us to look look towards a technological future versus like, ooh, fun laser swords, you know? Um, (laughs) So I, I think that a lot of it is just in our perception of it. But I think it also comes down to how we are analyzing media because we have different expectations for fantasy versus sci-fi. We have, when you're looking at a sci-fi, you are looking for what is this saying about how human beings may change in the future? What is this teaching us about X, Y, Z thing? Whereas fantasy, we're looking at it through a totally different, we're analyzing it through a totally different lens. So, yeah. That's good. That's really helpful. Less helpfully, people will say, uh, is it a spaceship or is it a wizard? That's I'm stupid. Like, well, what, what about, about space, space wizards? wizards? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like yeah. exactly. They're a oh. thing. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, yeah totally. That's so good. Uh, I There's so much. There's so much. To, I, I wanted to touch on one more thing. Maybe I can clip it out from my park notes because that's where all the big bucks are. But um, <laughs> I, I want to talk about your, your essay process, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, you come up with a new video most like Fridays. Um, are you working on your essay all week long or do you do it on that Friday morning? I'm sure. So, this, but... uh, I, I, this process is something that if I if I can quit my day job, which unfortunately I like. But when I when I eventually quit my day job, um, my process will become hopefully much healthier because mm-hmm. uh, currently the way I do it is the weekend before a video goes up. That is like my weekend for that video. So I, I start on Friday because I, I only work three days a week at my day job. Um, I start on Friday morning and I'll have done research. Like if there's a book I need to read or something, I don't start reading the book that morning. Right. But Friday is when I start gathering my notes and, you know, get way more notes that I could possibly need because mm-hmm. I'm accidentally way too thorough. Uh, so I take notes on everything. If it's a familiar topic like Tolkien, usually I can get the notes done in a day. If it's something like the Dune video, sometimes that'll take me like two days. Um, and then I usually just take about five or six hours to get a first draft of a script out on saturday um saturday and sunday i'm editing that script i send it over to my partner and he checks over my scripts just to make sure i'm not saying anything really stupid Mm. um and then on monday or sunday night um i record my videos i edit them on monday and then they go up on friday so i oh that's awesome it is a process that's incredibly fast, which has the negative point of I don't have any free time uh, and they could also be better if I spent more time on them. But to a degree, it also keeps me from hyper focusing too much on one topic and really laboring over. Is this the exact right word choice? How exactly do I want to format this thing? It, it keeps me from being able to to linger on those things too much. So I'm, I'm the same way. Uh, mine's a little bit more haphazard than yours, but <laughs> It's like I just pull the trigger because I I get stuck in these like research holes. And like, yeah. They and part of it's pride because I'm like they need to know that I also read that. Like, yeah. Part of it's pride. Part of it's like preemptive because I'm like I know they're gonna hit me in the comments, so I want to yep. want to acknowledge like I know you guys know this, but I want to know as much as I possibly can. Read as many yeah. books as I can. Yeah, totally. Um, Jess, you you're also on Instagram. I am. Um, yes. How do you? Do you have any kind of method for avoiding the infinite scroll when you're supposed to be writing an essay? It really just depends. I'm 
Luckily, uh, because I do my scripts in a, a tight turnaround, uh, usually I'm way too anxious about mm. getting a video done to let myself doom scroll too much. It also helps that uh, this sounds bad. I don't have hobbies right now. I'd love to have hobbies, but unfortunately, I monetized all of them, so they became my job. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> um, I know yes. you know? And it's like, so I do, cra- you know, my, my day job involves crafting and stuff. I make puppets. It's It sounds bizarre, but I swear it's an industry. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so I make puppets, and so that gets my craft- crafting stuff out of the way. And then my other hobbies are, like, doing things that end in a tangible product. So I've never been big on video games. I like watching TV, but I also like watching TV with people. So if there's not somebody around, I don't really feel the need to watch TV. When it comes to doom scrolling and stuff, I do it, but I, you know, usually I'm a, I'm able to let my anxiety about getting another video done uh, overrule that and then get me back to writing. It also really helps. Like, I, you know, I have certain focus methods like very particular like ambient music things that i once i pop my headphones on and once i'm sitting at my desk or once i'm outside with my laptop i can really lock in uh to do what i want to do but luckily i've uh i've learned how to train my brain to um dangle the carrot in front of the right thing Mm -hmm. in order to get me to focus on the right thing that's so good i have i have so many i have like a billion notebooks that help me and then i have a little timer and I yeah. walk in on uh, box study music. There's this YouTube yep. video. It's got millions of views. And I'm sure like a hundred thousand of you know in mind. <laughs> I'm just like lock in, start it. It's four hours long. And it's yeah, like, exactly. Four, four hours of work. It's a lot of it is just kind of learning to trick your brain. Like when I have a big project coming up, like the Dune video, I, I've or the Frankenstein video, where it's this like new topic that I've probably read, but I need to like really lock in on learning about this new subject. I have this process that everybody around me really loves when I do this, where I take the month before and I don't think about anything but Dune. And all I listen to is things about Dune or I'm listening to Dune. And all I talk to the people around me exactly Mm -hmm. is about Dune. And, you know, my housemate who I live and work with really loves it when I do that, when it's something she doesn't care about. But, uh, yeah, it's you you just got to kind of trick your brain into doing what you want it to do. Uh, I, that's how I found your stuff, actually, because I was I was doing the Dune stuff and I found one of your videos and it's like, all right, here we go. But I, I like obsess over it. And then I, I have to talk about it, too, and do like some active recall in order to make it in my head. So I'm like, I tell my wife, I'm like, we got to go for a walk. I'm so sorry. You just have, have to, to hear about this. Yeah, I have to just it's talk just to you. So it's it's well, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. No, oh, definitely not. That's good. Well, um, folks. Uh, that's gonna have to do it for now, but you can find a bunch more videos by Jess and uh, you can find her on Instagram as well. I'll put the links in the description, but it's Jess of the Shire on YouTube. If you're watching this, you probably already know who she is. So uh, <laughs> go check her out. Jess, thanks so much for, for all your time here. This has been that's awesome. Great being here. All right, that's gonna have to do it, folks. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.